So welcome everybody. This is the um, third talk and the task today is to complete this whirlwind tour of the four Rupajanas. Um, so we need to, I need to recap a bit because the same principle applies that to talk about any of the higher jhanas, the earlier ones have to be established at some point. So even though we talked about them last time, I need to recap. So the four jhanas, they form an interlinked series. They're not, they're not completely independent by a long way. The common theme is separation from everyday sensory consciousness towards eventually towards jhana consciousness. And this reaches its culmination in the fourth rupa jhana. The samadhi and the upeka of the fourth rupa jhana completes the whole series of the four rupa jhanas. So the first rupa jhana that we talked about last time is all about mastering attention and redirecting that attention from away from sensory consciousness, away from thinking the habits of comparison and naming, we redirect it towards the breath as the meditation object. And in order to do this, meditators have to understand, first of all, how to place attention, which is Vitaka, and then how to keep that going without losing the object, sustaining attention, vichara. And the first one is relatively easy. It's just like a, a simple mental act of attending to the number in Anapanasati. But the second one, vichara, in order to maintain continuity, knowing where we are, in other words, there has to be some understanding of meaning and salience and feeling. And so the two together, Vitaka and Vichara, they're very similar to the two Bojangas that we spoke about in the last series of talks, Sati and Dhamma Vichaya. So when attention is understood and when it becomes effectively automatic, the meditator begins to feel more confident um, usually a sense of contentment begins to develop because the, the state is less disturbed. We don't have to do so much to keep, to keep going the sensory consciousness processes. And also, more energy is released because a lot of the energy which goes into sustaining all those brain networks that underlie sensory consciousness is no longer required. So that energy is freed. <coughs> and the processes of PT develop. We start to feel energy, particularly in the body. And the sensory consciousness habits, as they fade, and we feel freer from them, we, know, we normally experience some degree of contentment. And one or two people commented in the questions that they noticed that sometimes when that arises, it's difficult to actually embrace it. Um, almost like we shy around, shy away from feeling, feeling or trusting that happiness. A lot of that is just getting used to it. But the reason underlying it is quite interesting because in everyday consciousness, there's a very, very deep um, habit of vigilance. It's related to protection, you know, it's a deep kind of fight flight awareness. So there's a sort of vigilance to threat. So when we start to feel happy, it's difficult initially to just trust it. You know, there may be a risk if we let down our guard. But when you get used to it, it becomes more familiar, 
and we, we can start to trust it. So in the first Rupa Jhana, the, the dominant Jhana factors are Vitaka and Vichara. And secondarily, secondary factors are PT, beginnings of Sukha, and the moments of absorption, one point in us, Ekagata But the key factors are Vitaka and Vichara. Once attention is habitual, stable, and we can just trust it will carry on, the, the second Rupa Jhana doesn't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about keeping attention going. So the second Rupa Jhana is all about understanding PT and feelings. <coughs> in the body, <coughs> It's probably more accurate to say in the body, we are aware of sensations and in the mind, feelings. We also become much more conscious of any disturbance that interrupts or interferes with the stillness. So a lot of the second Rupa Jhana is getting familiar with noticing stillness, disturbance, and feeling, and eventually finding a way to lead it into a deeper, deeper stillness. Excuse me. Most of the awareness of pity to begin with tends to be quite exciting and also, you know, quite powerful because that's where a lot of the energy has gone, no longer needed for the everyday consciousness. It's freed and we feel it in, in the body, just like the body is waking up. And nevertheless, there's an, there's an underlying impulse towards more stillness. A lot of that depends on the invocation at the beginning. And to do that, just by practicing for getting more familiar with the processes, the PT starts to become more better understood and eventually becomes more stable and quietens down and becomes part of the part of the samadhi. Even if you didn't know anything about the word pasadi or tranquilization, it tends to be a kind of automatic process. So, when we want to move to the third Rupa Jhana, if PT has become relatively stable, then we don't need to worry about it so much. The body becomes just um, part of the, part of the um, absorption, part of the samadhi. And the feelings and sensations become clearer. If the PT has been really stabilized, there's no, will be no disturbance in the body at all. So what remains is just mental feeling, happiness, and if there's any attachment to this, or to feelings and sensations in the body, then it may not fully develop. But if the second Rupa Jhana has been sufficiently developed, it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. You know, it's a, it's a mistake to think we have to perfect every stage before going to the next. But if it's sufficiently good, and the, the no disturbance remains in the body, then in the third Rupa Jhana, we experience just mental feeling, which can be completely pure in the sense of no disturbance whatsoever. When we look at the, the brain study at this point, when the third Rupa Jhana develops. All the networks that used to be active across the brain start to quieten down. 
and they're replaced by a focus at the crown of the head, which goes down into the body via the brainstem. But no disturbance in the, all the sensory consciousness networks. And the experience of the meditator is the simple, very simple, deep satisfaction. Sometimes people call it, you know, bliss, but actually words don't really capture it. But the main quality of it is that it's completely undisturbed. And in the texts such as the Vimutti Magga and Visuddhi Magga, the experience of the meditator is described as feeling fully conscious, completely fully conscious with no doubt, no distraction, nothing left out. And if this is the first time that someone has practiced or experienced the third Rupachana, it's fully conscious for the first time. This is the um, characterizing feature of the third Rupachana. And the simile for this is the picture that came up on the flyer for this, um, this talk. This is a picture, it's, it's, it's a real picture, believe it or not, a whole field full of um, lotus flowers opening within hours, within a day or so. Um, it's a very unusual climac climatic condition in uh, somewhere in Thailand a few years ago. But the simile is that the lotus flower emerges completely clean and un unsullied from the, the murky water, rises above it. And the experience in the corresponding experience in the third Rupa Jhana is of the kind of onlooking presence. Um, the meditator feels fully aware, vividly aware actually, fully present, but it's not the kind of consciousness of anything such as this or that. It's just presence. So this is, this is the difference between jhana consciousness and sensory consciousness. So if the third Rupa Jhana is so perfect, why do we need, um, is there any need to practice the fourth Rupa Jhana? Particularly if you think, you know, we're, we're lay meditators, it's not a bad thing to be quite happy. So why, why do we need to even consider something beyond that? And it's a good point because um, leading an, an everyday life as lay meditators is quite complex. And it's not just ourselves, we're responsible or connected to others. We have um, work responsi responsibilities, family responsibilities, very different to a monk or someone meditating in a cave. So in this tradition, in lay traditions generally, there is no um, injunction for someone to um, develop the jhanas um, at a particular time. It depends on circumstances, it depends on a lot of conditions. One of the, fact, one of the benefits of having a, a large lay sangha that we have now is that you have a lot of different examples of how people manage this with different jobs, different family responsibilities, how people manage to balance the everyday life with the meditator's life. So there's no hurry here. Take your time, listen to others and observe how others do it. And remember that Nai Bhumman many times has commented that it's very important to to be normal. So the fourth Rupa Jhana, I have to say something about it, but bear that in mind that the conditions will determine when you want to develop it more actively. So there may come a time, for example, when you realize in your meditation 
that even happiness in the third group of jhana is a, a disturbance, maybe a very subtle disturbance, but a disturbance nonetheless to the stillness and peace of the absorption in the, in the third group of jhana. This is most likely to arise at the end of a practice while you're, you may be staying in the stillness to fully experience it before coming out progressively back to sensory consciousness. And at that moment, an understanding might arise that there is an attachment to that happiness, no matter how subtle. And there may also arise an impulse to let go of that, that dependence. And the impulse is an impulse towards more complete freedom. Freedom from dependence on even happiness. So it's not just stillness. It's a recognition that something is still not completely free if it depends on happiness. At that point, a meditator might choose to re-enter jhana, and if the timing and conditions are right, the experience and depth of the stillness may become free of any attachment or craving whatsoever. No longer any need, even for the reward of happiness. And this develops into the pristine samadhi, depending on nothing, of the fourth rupa jhana. The main quality is freedom, freedom from any tie whatsoever. So the characterizing factors of the fourth rupa jhana are first of all the all-encompassing samadhi, like in the third rupa jhana, the mind-body samadhi, but also to recognize the even more perfect quality of that samadhi in the fourth rupa jhana, the freedom. The other factor that's recognized alongside samadhi is, is upeka, equanimity. And it's not just a kind of passive equanimity. It's rather like, um, you know, the, the equanimity Upeka that develops in the Eightfold Path is one of the factors of enlightenment. It has a quality of wisdom, freedom from suffering. Now the simile for the, the fourth Rupa Jhana is of being enveloped in a white cloth. Um, it's a very intriguing simile. And actually in the practices we've had at the National Center. Occasionally we practiced what this feels like. A meditator might sit in front of a group, uh, enveloped, totally enveloped in a white cloth. And we've been doing this very occasionally, not as a regular practice, on and off over the last 20 years. To try and understand what it is that's meant by that simile. Now, last year, someone, I'm pretty sure it was you, Rob, uh, gave me a, a copy of a picture taken at a talk that someone had given, an ethnologist, <coughs> who'd been studying practices in Laos, unusual practices in Laos. Not a very clear picture, but it's someone sitting enveloped in a kind of shroud. Now, it's a bit different to how, to how we do it. And I think when Rob sent me this copy, you mentioned that the, the person who took the picture wasn't aware of the uh, parallel to the fall through pajana. And the differences to when we, we've, we've tried this are that first of all, we find that it's very important that the, the cloth completely envelops the body so that nothing is left uncovered. And secondly, that the ideally the white cloth is is not completely opaque. That there's a subtle trans, trans, transparency, so that the person sitting enveloped in the white cloth experiences a very intriguing kind of liminal state 
aware of the, the outside sensory world, but also em embedded inside in, in the jhana, world of jhana consciousness. It's a kind of neither nor experience. In a way, already presaging the arupa, formless jhanas. So the, these uh, teachings, fragments of teachings that come up in Cambodia, Laos and Thailand are very interesting because they do connect to what we experience in practice. But sometimes they're, they're not completely perfect. So before we practice, the last thing I want to mention is a few words on how we move between the jhanas. Remembering that uh, you can't think yourself into jhana. So it's not possible to come out, think about the next jhana, and just go into it on that basis. We can't do it through, through ordinary thinking processes. So to talk about this, first of all, there is a, a difference between practicing in a group where someone takes the role of calling the changes from one stage to the next, which I'm doing on these talk, in these talks, and when you're practicing on your own. So let's take the, the example of the first Rupa Jhana as an example of how to then develop the second Jhana. If you're practicing on your own, you would traditionally resolve at the beginning of your practice to practice the first Jhana for say 30 minutes or whatever, rather like you resolve to wake up in the morning at whatever time without an alarm clock. And at that point, after that time has gone by, you, there's a moment of refle reflection, a bit like waking in the morning without the alarm clock, but it's a moment of reflection, rather like the stillness at the end of a practice. And the same thing happens if someone, if you're in a group and the, the group conductor rings, sounds the bell. There's a moment of reflection on the state, on the stillness. Now that moment of reflection is very, very important and very interesting. Because the, because the first jhana is so close to ordinary consciousness, to thinking, it's very easy if you're not so experienced to find yourself quickly thinking about what you've done and then thinking also about how to develop the second Rupa Jhana. But at that point, if that happens, you're, you're caught because if, you, if you've reverted to sensory consciousness and thinking, you have to re-establish the first Rupa Jhana, Vitaka and Vichara, and do the whole process again. So the task is to resist that pull back into thinking, to stay with the stillness, which is why I've been stressing so much at the end of all your practices, to stay with the stillness and really fully experience what, what it's like. So if you stay with that stillness, then the quality of the stillness in coming out of the first Rupa Jhana is firmness and stability, which are the qualities of Vitaka and Vichara. But it's just the experience. You don't think of the word Vitaka and Vichara, but you know immediately that you've established firmness and stability. And if at that point you immediately advert back into Jhana, you will do so not needing uh, to pay any attention to the Takara Machara. You will know implicitly that they're there as the foundation. And you go back in to the beginnings of developing the second Rupa Jhana. What you experience are all the sensations in the body, the feelings in the mind, and then you work with those and develop the second Rupa Jhana. And the same principle applies 
in going from the second to the third or the third to the fourth. The most tricky one is actually the first, the second, because it's so vulnerable to falling back into thinking. And this is one of the reasons why there's a lot of confusion at that point among people who practice samatha and want to develop jhana. It's very easy to come out back into sensory consciousness and be quite excited at what you've experienced and overestimate what you've experienced. It's very easy to believe that you might have um, mastered the first Rupa Jhana. And more so, because the mind is quite clean at that point, quite flexible and sharp, it's very easy to create um, experiences based on what you might have read or expectations. So sometimes a meditator might become stuck and need, really need the help of their teacher or the group to understand exactly where they're at, not to immediately assume too much about the experience. This is, the, this is something I often do at this point. This is a wax, wax taper practice. I can't do it online. I've thought of all sorts of ways of trying to do it live. Um, basically, it just doesn't work. It's impossible to get the quality of the sound when the weight drops. Many of you have seen this, but quite a lot of you haven't, probably 50-50. The, the candle is a beeswax candle. And as it burns down, the weights are released in turn. And as each weight drops into the bowl, there's a sharp crack. And those are the triggers, the points at which meditators move to the next jhana. There are different ways of using this practice, but I'm talking about one way to direct the um, sequence of practicing the jhanas in a way to embed them. Because the candle is this sort of handmade beeswax candle, you cannot predict exactly when it will burn down to the next weight. So with your eyes closed, you can't second guess this. So there's no point in trying. So it's actually it's quite helpful to meditators to let go or try to let go of expectations. You know, if you're in a group with a, a teacher sounding the bell, there's still some connection to the teacher and this could be a very subtle um, assumption of when the teacher would strike the bell. But in this case, it's impersonal. It's up to the candle. Maybe it's up to a few more things too. But anyway, the candle burns down. And if the meditator has completely let go of expectation, the absorption is likely to be quite deep. You know, it's a matter of letting go of expectations of time and space. And so it allows you really to let go of even more complication and just settle into deeper and deeper samadhi. When the weight drops, there's a sharp crack which breaks the stream of consciousness very fast. One moment you're in samadhi, the next moment, you are brought back to the very threshold of samadhi. And the same task arises to resist any pullback into thinking about it. Basically, what's happening in terms of, um, for example, Abhidhamma theory, is that you remain at the threshold of jhana. You might call it um, upachara samadhi. If you've been practicing the first rupajana, then you recognize the quality of stability. You then immediately advert back in and you will automatically be developing the next jhana and so on through the series. At the end of the second rupajana, the crack breaks your stream of consciousness 
you immediately recognize in the stillness that the body is perfectly calm, no more disturbance, assuming you've developed the second Rupa Jhana sufficiently. You immediately advert back in, then it would be on the basis of developing the next jhana, the third Rupa Jhana, and so on. So the process is actually very simple and very quick. Having done it with something like the wax taper practice is very helpful for a meditator then going back to our individual practice and having still that sense of how to do that, how to let go um, in that way. And just rely on the the aditana, the the determination at the beginning to end whichever jhana it is, and then quickly experience the quality, and then advert into the next one. So we can't do it um, online in real life, but we can imagine something like that process, and. Bear that in mind when I sound the bell to, in your own way, try out what I was just suggesting. So when we practice, I'll sound the bell to start, and then I'll sound the bell the first time after to move from the first to the second, Rupa Jhana, the next bell from the second to the third, the next from the third to the fourth, and then the final bell to end the practice. If you lose track of where you're at, don't worry. Just imagine letting go of whatever complication there might be and just go back in. And you will almost certainly connect to where we're, where we're at. And then at the end of the practice, <coughs> in the usual way, stay with the stillness. But if anything comes to mind, Feel free to share it with the group and no one needs to respond until several people have maybe made a contribution and then we'll see where it goes. So start practice. Okay, so if anything comes to mind, feel free to voice it. Don't worry about whether you think it's relevant or not. It's bound to be. <coughs> no need for anyone to respond. Then someone else might want to contribute something. And then another person, and another person, and perhaps a, uh, a theme might arise. Um, I just wanted to um, say at one point there was enormous heat and then it felt like there was a hair, and I've had this before, like a hair on the left-hand side in my throat. And I sometimes wonder whether that represents something, like there's something slightly stuck in the throat and then it seemed to, I wasn't aware of it then, so... It went, well, that was it. Mm -hmm. You said, uh, Anne, you said enormous what? Heat. Heat. I felt really, yeah, I've had it, had, I did a practice this morning as well enough. Sometimes this heat can come even when I'm not practicing, when something, like something, quite fundamental insight to insight's too big a word but something fundamental truth is coming and this is enormous heat right through my body do you mean feet as in foot no heat temperature high temperature <laughs> okay <laughs> interesting maybe i need some more feet <laughs>
Yeah, um, I, I was I was sort of wondering a bit about the um, the changes in stages in the practice and that sense of sort of knowing where one is or potentially being pulled back into something and the sort of the um, the parallel actually with the in and out breath. So sort of end of the in breath to the out breath and vice versa because it, it often seems like there's <clears throat> something sort of parallel happening there. That there, there's a sort of a, a place where the mind can sort of continue and rest in that state or actually can sort of be pulled off um, or, or sort of move back into something. So it, it, it seemed to me just sort of thinking about it and, and from the last practice that there, there was possibly a parallel there between those, those things. Do you mean a parallel between the process of changing from the in to the out breath and the out breath to the in breath and changing between the jhanas? Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's what I was wondering about because the way you described it earlier, it, it seemed like there was something parallel happening. Okay. Yeah. I had an interesting experience uh, today, Paul, because I slightly misunderstood your instruction. Uh, I thought that you were going to ring a bell as they were at each change through the four jhanas, and so. I was <laughs> for a long time. I was just as it were peacefully, as it were resting in the first stage, just waiting, waiting, and waiting, <laughs> thinking, okay, what's happening here? Maybe, maybe my computer's not working. Maybe. So then I went into kind of worrying and thinking, and at some point I actually, I just thought, actually, don't worry about it. And it was like going back into the taper wax uh, practice, just, it's okay. And it was really, really helpful to just let go of the, as to whether the needing, it's like there's a part that needs to be in control as to what stage I'm in or what place I'm in or where am I in or, or location in time and space. And there was something about the uncertainty, which initially was disconcerting, but actually the uncertainty then became Kind of freedom to just rest with whatever it was. It was really, really interesting. So you you think you misunderstood my my instruction? <laughs> okay. Just the same experience for me. I was expecting the bell, <laughs> and. Um, and I had similar experiences to Charles, a little bit of worry, what was happening. But I let just let go as well. I decided, well, it doesn't matter. And I, when I let go, a lot of pity came up. I had a lot of, a lot of energy in the body. It was very, very interesting. And then it was just a beautiful deep practice after that. Mm. And I completely let go of all expectations. So it was quite similar you know, to the candle uh, table practice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so are you saying you did that deliberately, Paul? <laughs> no, very, very strange, you know, how these, these things happen. Um, what I said at the beginning was what I intended. Then, when 30 minutes passed and I picked up the bell, at that moment I realized I had not sounded the bell at all. <laughs> and I wondered what that was about. And now I know what it was about. <laughs> hmm. Very it was a very interesting exploration of kind of how my mind, and perhaps Aileen, you're saying the same, um, moves to worry and concern, but mm. out of it. And it's actually not a big step. You sometimes think, oh gosh, I need a long process to move out of my everyday kind of worrying and checking and concern. Actually, it wasn't mm. very complicated. It was just, okay, do I go to the right or do I go to the left? You 
I'd like to actually um, add to what people have been saying because it feels very appropriate. I couldn't get into uh, to hear Paul's talk this morning. I got to the the point where waiting for the host to the host is waiting to let you in, and, but nothing happened. And I waited for about half an hour. Then I actually emailed somebody, and then I I got a link back, and then eventually I got in. And it must have been in the middle of the meditation. Mm. And there's that place of me thinking, oh, shit, well, oh, God, it's not worth it, you know. So oh, ju just, just go up, you know, <laughs> go off, sign off. But I stayed and I, and I thought, okay, I'll see what I can do. And it's that kind of place of I could feel that kind of frustration and anger coming up in me and sort of thinking, for me, it goes, oh, it's a waste of time. And want to trash it to reject it it's no good it's not going to happen mm. and there's another part of me saying oh hold on hold on just, just you're here now just see what happens and and I sort of started the meditation with the counting and and I could feel my you know that there was a process I was starting to to enter I was starting to settle because I knew some, something was releasing in me because I yawned and I yawned and I yawned. And that's usually part of my process of settling my energy and sort of coming more present. So I was quite surprised that that was happening as quickly as it did. So it was worth being here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll sign off now. Um, I can say something that... Um... I, I was rem reminded of the um, of the sheer power of intention, you know, just setting that intention mm. to go from from bell to bell, whatever that may be, uh, we're, we're, and it was surprising for me as well. <laughs> I, I had decided we were probably going to do a two-hour practice or something today, and that, that was fine actually for, for me this morning. It was okay, um, but just at home, just that, and I wondered if it related to the invocation. I, I wasn't that some of the previous talks but you know that that sort of invoking something in yourself to set something up and just go there in a very simple way seemed to me this morning to be extremely powerful i would say also on that vein um when we started i was very aware of the sensory world because i'd opened a window um because it's very warm here and there was a lot going on out there. There was people throwing things into a skip. There was somebody else doing some maintenance work with a big heavy duty machine, traffic driving back and forth. And, and I'd made this resolution that I wasn't getting, going to get drawn to any of it. And it was a little difficult at first, but actually I don't remember anything about it afterwards. It just went. I wasn't aware of all that noise and busyness out there. So, yeah, I think it was the power of just making that intention, really, at the beginning. I just wanted to add that from the comments, it really brought to mind the beautiful picture of the lotus flower, of coming up from the uncertainty, coming up from the noise of the skip <clears throat> and the busyness. The, the beauty of the flower came. Yeah. Uh, Nicola? I had a similar experience to Charles and those who said that as well about expecting. Then the letting go um, happened and um, just just wanted to say what I observed um, when the bell rang. Mm. There was um, there was just this real <laughs> resonance, and I noticed the sense of smell, and it sort of touched something um, with an innocence. Uh, the, the smell reminded me of something of my childhood, and I've just felt it was. It was, um, I felt almost like cleansed. There was, a, there was a real sort of peace and cleansing. 
Um, Because as the bell went, I just spent time observing my feelings. And um, yeah, it felt very, very um, cleansed and calm. (laughs) I felt not ringing the bell has really helped me to develop the stillness much better than ringing the bell and uh, which would have disturbed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wasn't expecting the ringing even. Mm. That's very interesting. You know, I think um, giving these talks online rather than in front of people on a retreat, um, first the Bhujanga talks and now these, has been a really interesting experience and learning things that I hadn't fully realized before about the connection between people practicing meditation. It being something not limited to being face to face in the same room. And that is something that just is, you know. I don't feel any particular urge to try to rationalize it or think it, but it it just certainly, certainly is. I think a lot of it to do with trust. And so I noticed the same thing happening with the Bojanga talks, that once you start once you commit to a series of looking at something, in that case, the Bhajangas, and in this case, the Yoga Vachara, it's rather similar to starting walking on a path. That already at the beginning, there's something about the whole process is understood at some level. And if, if there's a degree of trust in that, then it's possible to let go of the personal component that might otherwise control things. So, the same thing with the Bhajanga talks. It's something to do with starting with the beginning, an invocation. And there's already a direction set up, this is just the third, towards understanding something about the path the path, the Buddhist path, um, which is so closely linked to the jhanas and uh, the bhajangas. So something is actually understood by everyone committing to listen to these talks. And for me, has been part of that in the kind of conducting, to some extent, the talk. But even I am not completely in control of the process. So... When I came to sound the final bell, only at that moment did I was I aware that I hadn't sounded the bell before. And at the same time, understood something that that was probably what was needed. Something to do with letting go and trusting, and like you just said, about anything that interferes with that can be a bit of an obstruction. Um, And who is it who controls that process? It's not me. It's something to do with the collective endeavor, you know, which is really interesting to see. Now, I think one of the most powerful things we are dealing with is the the whole idea of um, control and expectation because the, the the everyday consciousness that we live within is is completely uh, consumed with maintaining some kind of continu- continuity and control Um, of sensory input, memory, possible actions, all of which 
links into our, our superficial sense of I. It gives a time continuity to I am. I exist as Paul Denison, or I do, from the moment just past to the present to the next one. All that is going on all the time. So to practice as we just did, where there's nothing to hang on to, you know, when you, when nothing comes as a marker, to let go of time, and you find that actually it's not a frightening place. It's very free once you, once you accept it. And the, the, the fact that time is no longer a concern means that it's immense. You know, the, the, the field of experience is just immense. So we just finished the four Rupa Chandras, which is then very interesting because the next stage is exactly letting go of that control of time and space into the formless jhanas. So something in the practice just now almost automatically arises that gives us a sense of where, where, where we're headed, what we're touching on. Something which is like the fourth Rupa jhana, increasingly free. And then in the Arupa jhanas, without any limits. Also, you know, it's very interesting that even though um, you may not feel you're in a good place to practice meditation, um, it may be exactly the right um, time, place to practice meditation. And to let go, to let go of that assumption is also interesting. Yeah. Yes, well, I was um, thinking that um, I got a bit lost like the others and I thought I'd made a mistake or turned the sound off uh, wrongly. But um, in the end, I just relaxed and perhaps felt it wasn't as deep a practice as I'd intended it to be. Uh, that's what happened. But um, on reflection, I think I depend on the structure so much, really. Um, and we do have a very structured practice, you know, as well. And I, and I felt that was one of the distinctive features of our practice, that there's clear stages and distinctive aspects. And, um, and when we get to these more refined stages, the, the, the distinctions aren't perhaps so, so clear until you develop them. But um, the, it made me wonder whether actually unstructured is also valid, you know, or is equally valid, you know. Um, uh, I've tended to sort of think once you've lost the structure, you've lost the whole thing somehow. And, uh, um, but, but reflecting on it, I perhaps could have made more of that unstructured and tr trusted it a bit, a bit more. Um, and, and sort of, what is it? Not sunk into it, but you know, totally allow myself to to be in it. Um, but it's it's that judgment, isn't it? When would I do an unstructured practice? When would I keep to the structure? Um, I just thought I'd mention that. Well, I think what you described is you're already touching on that <clears throat> boundary. You know, we're at the middle of six talks. We've been talking about the rupa jhanas. And the next stage is to let go of structure completely into Arupajana. Yeah. So there's a very good reason why the jhanas deal first with form. And then, only then, to fully understand form, to be able to let go of that structure. Yeah. Otherwise, it could be quite frightening. But the interface between the two, first Rupa, then Arupa. Then also Arupa will teach you more about Rupa. Until finally, you know, you start to wonder what is the reality between the two? <laughs> Look forward to it. <laughs> Yeah, kind of related to that. Just recently, I found myself 
in one of the Rupajana levels. And after a while of you know being in that level with a certain breath length, I've just thought let it just let it be as it is, just as just being present, the breath length might alter. So can just kind of relaxing into it, just as you might be if you're walking up a hill by a path that you know, but then you get to a point and you just stop and be present as it is there. And then having done that for a while, then might go back to the structure and maybe alter the breath length and the settling. And then after a while in that, just relax into it. So structure, unstructured, structure, unstructured. Um, I'm interested in the, um, the, the, the reference to the structure because um, I know we have this six sort of 16 <clears throat> stage structure, but it has seemed to me very much um, that it's a, I've thought of it um, you know, as a structure that just reflects um, a natural process that, you know, touching on those different jhanas, it's a, it's a process that actually sort of feels as if it happens naturally without necessarily, you know, given the right conditions, um, without having to make, to necessarily have that structure or to make conscious intentions. But um, I'm just wondering now if that seems now like a natural process because of working with the structure so much. So I don't know if you, if you see what I mean. Um, so it's a question mark really. Mm -hmm. Okay. In regards to the structure, because of the the bell, it meant that a I went into practice straight away, so that came very quickly. But I stayed in the counting, so I stayed there for you know ages and then then sort of the word you know letting go of complication and trust was just the big thing so there was nothing coming but I still went into the following at a certain point and I felt that the sort of in terms of developing that the, the jhana the first jhana that was happening there you know it was like working with the practice working with the breath in a way with much more intention, much more intention in choosing not to be complicated and not to, you know, not to think about it, but just, and yet still to have intention. It's funny to be not thinking, to be not complicated. And, and yet I was aware of intention mm. and to cultivate and to develop. So, yeah. And so, when people mentioned, oh, um, oh, I thought oh, maybe I've missed the bell, or maybe I've done this, or maybe I've done that, that didn't come up for me. Hmm. And, I, and I got through to a certain point, and I think I was, I'd got into this sort of settling stage, and I'd already sort of, it was strange to have the structure sort of crossing over. And, and at the end, when you rang the bell, and I realised, oh, something's, something's gone different here. There was like a slight arising of a feeling which I was about to label as something like I've done something wrong or something, 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 or I've missed something. Mm. Except it wasn't. And when I let it be, it was just a bit like Nicola said, a certain opening and a certain softness that was there actually, in fact. Mm. You know? Mm. I, think, I think what you're describing is as well as that how how pervasive the habit of thinking is. You know, even though we've got a structure, as Jackie mentioned, you know, 16 stages, progressive stages, counting, following, touching, settling, longest, longer, shorter, shortest, length of breath. Even though we've got that structure, which the one way of looking at it is, is that it 
it it helps us to um, move to more subtle stages in the practice. Even then, to let go of the habits of of thinking um, and recognition, knowing where you are, all those habits of sensory consciousness is is a big is a big challenge, and. Often it's a, a, we only realize after a long time that we've still been doing it. Not, not 100% maybe. I mean, there may be times that arise when you let go of some of it. But it's still, what you're describing is realizing that there's a touch of it that remains for a long, long time. And then when you start to let go of that, it's like an anchor. It's like a security to know that by thinking and the sense of time, when we let it go, then it's, it's quite a breakthrough to realize that you can trust the process. And that's partly what you're describing. And I think it happens to many meditators that it's a surprise to realize just how much we still are caught up in, in thinking and trying to formulate something and not entirely trusting just letting go. I think partly also it's um, a bigger problem for us in a kind of Western um, culture where there's a lot of emphasis on thinking, on cognitive processes, compared to, for example, in, in Thailand, uh, in rural areas, you know, where people are much more on a feeling level. Um, so I, I can remember seeing in um, one particular temple where we were visiting to take part in the, um, some ceremony. They didn't have enough monks. <coughs> and just in front of where we were sitting, there were a row of, of novices, temple boys, maybe half a dozen. And they'd been temple boys for two or three years, you know, you can't, you can't take the full ordination until you're 20. So they were probably in their teams, arranging from uh, young teams up to 15, 16. And of course, that's how Nai Booman started. He was a village um, uh, ruffian. <laughs> and then he became a, a temple, a temple boy, and his life took a different direction. Anyway, this particular monastery had one or two monks who specialized in very evocative forms of chanting that kind of very hypnotic, very powerful, and very cleverly attuned to the energy of pity in the body. It, it kind of carried you away. You know, you may have come across it sometimes with some of the Samatar chanting. Um, like the peak of Tripitika chant, for example, or the transcendent jhana chant. Anyway, I was looking at, remember looking at this group of, of temple boys, and they were, um, they were listening to the chant and they were taking part in the chant, and they were just lighting up with pity. They were somehow just allowing themselves to completely merge with the, with the chanting and the feeling. And they may have known, probably known nothing about the detailed technique of meditation, but they were just dropping into a state which was extremely peaceful, joyful, and with no expectation just in it, you know, just naturally, completely on a feeling level. And some people can do it just like that, you know, just, just go in in that way. We sometimes think too much, <laughs> and it's very difficult to very difficult to let that go. Mind you, there's a disadvantage the other way around. You know, people, for example, who practice um, Buddha practice, which is very popular still in Thailand often get a, get a sense of jhana very quickly. 
and get carried away in a way by the, the excitement and the, the joyfulness of it and find it incredibly difficult to um, to let go of that attachment and develop any any further. Hello. Um, just on that point, for me, I've, I've been very aware of that in throughout settling of how that marries together. And it's something, and that's where I think another kind of structure for me over the last few months has been very useful. That is to say, it doesn't, you know, something like, for me, it's been the four foundations of mindfulness. For others, it might be something else. But I th there needs to be, to me, there needs to be some way of marrying them together. And as that process of going through four jhanas uh, arises, uh, it, in other words, some way of carrying your head with you as well as that instinctive feeling and without the judging and labeling or the, the sanya or whatever you want to call them. But nevertheless, the head and the understanding being fully present. And for me, that maybe that, that that's where, you know, another that's where when we do study groups and things like that is very interesting because we can find uh, qualities you know which come up that we relate to and I I was thinking what what um, you know my Boomin's teaching of find your favorite practice and or and uh, and and that how much that it how lovely that is as well as what's your favorite Dhamma <laughs> and actually that favorite Dhamma is very interesting to follow the nose with that and and actually it, because it's there as a support too and the other thing just to come back to the sense of structure and I know I have said this before but I find it still to be true is that I love the 16 stages um, and um, in the sense that they're really there as a, a ladder of support um, and I, that and you know I had occasion recently of um, having to in a hospital situation where I had a loss of losing the sense of the breath um, <clears throat> because I, I was on a ventilator, it wasn't coronavirus, but it's still very strongly with me. And uh, um, that sense of, I realise what it was now when I look back on it, that uh, there were conversations going on about, um, oh, she's, uh, they were trying to take this ventilator out of me. I was fully conscious. And I could hear them saying things like, oh, she's, um, she's not breathing. And uh, I thought, well, in that case, I must be dead, but I can't be dead because I can hear them. <laughs> so what am I doing? Oh, I must be doing a rupa, that's all. They just, just get interested in the breath or whatever. And, uh, and then I realized that what was happening was, it's very easy when you've had a big tube inside you, I think I probably realized this in retrospect afterwards, but, uh, to rely on that tube. And it becomes very difficult to um, sort of, and, and so you need something else to get you breathing again in a funny sort of way. And that was when I realized that 16 stages was incredible, incredible, because it taught me how to move although it may not have been consciously from short, shortest to shorter to longer to longest, I had a structure by which to really work with breathing again and breathing coming back fully into my body. Mm -hmm. And I really, I'm not saying this to sort of, to sort of frighten anybody with a daft experience, but what I learned from it was that just because the structure you can't, you, you, that the, isn't the, the difference between visible and invisible. That just because the structure isn't there doesn't mean it isn't there. And that all the years we have of doing our practice, of developing these stages, and there may be a time, and I think part of, for me, part of the process is, is handing over and letting go and going into nothingness or going into whatever else it is or emptiness or whatever you want to call it and letting the breath do what it likes and 
it's all about the relationship be, between exploring and being creative with that. But knowing, in other words, having embodied the experience of the 16 stages, so your body knows you have those stages present. You don't need this to tell you that you've got them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that was, for me, that was a real experience, which really took me in an extreme ex situation. But it, it is, it, I feel it's relevant. That's why I'm mentioning it here now. I feel it's sort of, it, it is, it's a very helpful. Having a structure is a good thing. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, and it's learning how to play with that structure. So, yeah. Yeah. I think what what came to mind for me is the um, discussion Paul was giving about integrating PT and how we talk about sensations in the body, and then there's a move to mental feeling, and. <clears throat> Seems really interesting today, a lot of comments about sort of how to allow that process to happen in that when things are happening in the body, I find for myself, you can you kind of enjoy that aspect, but then the mental side isn't quite joined to that. So you can still make a kind of little story about what it is or why it's important or how it relates to a particular stage or whatever. But there's there's something about allowing the feeling into the mental world, which is, it feels kind of, it's at that point that the self really gets quite challenged because the feeling almost, it's almost like the feeling dissolves the kind of the thinking side of things. Um, and, but that's quite a, you don't actually have to do too much for that to happen. So I don't know, just, just that kind of, transition point between physical feeling and mental feeling seems really interesting somehow. And, and like others have been saying, you don't have to actually have to do too much to let that happen, but there has to be a kind of recognition that there's still a kind of gap there between the, the physical and the mental that it's almost as, just as, as soon as you allow something to happen, that can be bridged in some way. And the, the mental feeling is, is kind of, similar to the the physical but to me it almost had the quality of like um a joke today like when when it goes into the mental realm everything becomes like some kind of a joke <laughs> because the it's the taking the self seriously can, can't happen in the same way um so I, I hadn't really thought about it before as kind of the practice being a joke but that's what it felt like <laughs> Because you can't take yourself as seriously in mm. the same way. Mm. Yeah. I, I was just interested in what Paul was saying about um, the ways of moving from one channel to another. And I know that something, well, I find that quite often when I'm doing a meditation, the channels just, they, they just, they just go, if I step back, they just sort of blend, not blend into each other, but they move from one to another. And I feel sort of, I, I'm quite happy with that because I feel that they go at the right time for me that they've reached a certain point of development and that they change at what, what feels like the right time. And I've always sort of felt like at, at some point I need to get more of a control over this and set myself times and be able to go from one to another and all that. But whenever it actually comes down to it, you know, I just feel that they move at the right time. Yeah. And I, I, I just wonder what Paul said, would say about the, I don't know, the conflict there. And I suppose it's best to be able to do both, is it? <laughs> I think everyone's got slightly different temperaments. And... You know, the, the jhana, the qualities of the jhanas are, to some extent, there to some degree in, in all the jhanas, in the different mix. And it may be that what you're describing is your way of getting familiar um, with what it feels like, you know, get what, what, is, what does it look like, what does it feel like in your experience? 
without actually going to the point of complete um, absorption in any of the jhanas, which is okay. There's no hurry. And then you may come to a point where you, you get a bit clearer about exactly where you are. And for example, when I suggest staying with the stillness at the end of a practice, um, don't forget to do that because if you if you come out and you just stay with the stillness without thinking, gradually you get a sense of where you've been. You know, is it mostly connected with um, like the qualities of attention and solidity and like in Vitaka and Vichara, or is it more connected with um, feelings in the body, or is it more connected with um, feelings in the mind, um, or is it empty of feeling? You know, if you stay with the stillness, you start to understand more clearly what the jhana factors are. Then at some point, you will find that in in a practice, you almost automatically go a bit deeper you know you you because you've realized something bit by bit you'll find yourself going deeper and deeper into more and more stillness without fearing it without needing to move around mentally you can trust it you go deeper and then when you come out and stay with the stillness then you'll understand where you've been whether it's the first rupa jhana or or the second so I think what you're describing is, is just your way of doing it. You, sometimes you have to just follow your instinct. And there's nothing wrong with what you're describing. You know? There'll be somewhere in it, there'll be an overall direction towards understanding and trusting the process and then going towards more stillness. You start to notice the, there's the in-breath, the out-breath, um, there's a stillness, and then there may be a nimitta, and then gradually it just gets more and more simple, more and more still. The breath becomes part of it and you just allow it, allow it to go deeper. So I think um, it's a good point maybe to finish on, 12 o'clock. Um, so I'm going to sign off. The next talk is uh, next Saturday on the first and second Harupa Jhanas. Final small thought. We now have a, a Samata Koan. What is the sound of no bell ringing? <laughs> <laughs>